Okay. Thanks for the introduction and uh, the invitation. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, graph neural nets, and uh, I will try to be actually more provocative, and then talking about some of the preliminary work I do uh, recently, and uh, hopefully this can provoke some thoughts from the audience and then um, further research uh, along this direction. So uh, I'm asking this question, uh, can graph neural net help logic inference, right? And uh, it touches upon one of these fundamental problems in AI in some sense. Uh, uh, it's a long-standing problem. People try to combine, in some sense, uh, perceptual ability with uh, logic reasoning. So nowadays, uh, everybody knows about deep learning, and it's a very nice tool, in some sense, for performing perceptual uh, uh, kind of task. For instance, you have deep learning model which can recognize uh, objects from images. And then, uh, but the problem of deep learning model is, uh, in order to build each individual uh, recognizer, uh, for instance, recognizing horses, you might need to provide thousands of horses as a training example. And but the, once you you train these kind of neural nets, uh, it can tolerate quite a lot of noises in your in your image. It, it can be image where very different varieties, and this recognizer is still able to recognize in the horses. But uh, when it comes to some of the task generalization tasks, for instance, uh, if you wanted to um, recognize a new object, for instance, uh, a canonical example logic inference can do is recognizing some uh, new object, for instance, zebra in this case. So if I want to recognize zebra, then for deep learning approach to do it, you will probably need to provide lots of uh, data points for zebra and retain the classifier to recognize zebra. But uh, for, for logic inference, it's, it's very different. Uh, you can actually provide a rule like that. Zebra is a horse plus dry pattern. And very quickly, you will be able to recognize uh, zebra. So in some sense, logic reasoning is providing some kind of language uh, where you can generalize to a new object or adapt to a new, new, new kind of objects uh, very quickly with a very small amount of data points. But logic inference uh, uh, very often is very rigid. Uh, if you have a very small number of conflicting sets, it's going to break the entire logic inference process. So uh, it, it will be nice that actually you will have some method which can combine uh, you know, perceptual ability and logic inference in, in a unified framework. And uh, you want something like this here, uh, where it requires a very small number of training data points to, to generalize to a new task, while at the same time being able to tolerate variations in your in inputs. Right? This is like a long-standing goal. And, and if you have a, such a method, actually nowadays there's a lot, lots of data set like this, uh, uh, needs a method like this. So people are building something called a multimodal knowledge base uh, nowadays. So essentially, uh, this knowledge base is collecting lots of relational information about enti uh, entities. Uh, and then each one of these entities may have a diverse amount of data associated to it. So for instance, in this particular case, a player, a football uh, soccer player, has an image attached to it, and also have a, a piece of test description attached to it. And then in the database, uh, some relational information is also curated. So we have deeper learning approach which can do uh, image recognition or some of the text processing for us. And uh, we also have logic inference approach which can reason about this graph kind of connectivity uh, uh, on top of this knowledge base, but there's no unifying framework in some sense to take into account these two sources of information together, right? So uh, a human, as a human being, actually we will be able to uh, easily uh, sort of uh, do this type of uh, reasoning over this multimodal knowledge base. Uh, for instance, if I asked uh, for this particular picture and that soccer player, which uh, team he is playing on, right? We can first look at the image recognizing the object and then uh, traverse this knowledge base and then make a prediction like uh, he is playing in Barcelona, right? Um, but we don't have a nice method for doing this uh, right now, okay? So uh, there's some, some recent technique developed in, in, in machine learning called graph neural nets and getting popular. And uh, it seems that it has some promises to scale this kind of uh, uh, method up, right? For the human being, we are able to do this very nicely, but uh, it's hard to scale up to many queries and do it autom in an automated fashion. Uh, uh, graph neural net seems to hold some promises for doing this, okay? Then what, what is graph neural net? Let me first just briefly introduce what is a graph neural net. So a uh, graph neural net, the mo most basic version may, may take a form like this. So uh, think about that you have a knowledge base, this entity edge, they are connected in a network structure. Each edge is going to correspond to some relationship. And the entity might have some additional feature attached to it. It could be some feature from the image, or it could be feature from text, okay? 
So what you want to do is to learn some kind of representation for each one of these entities, okay? It's a vector representation mu uh, for this entity. And this algorithm for learning this representation is going to compute in an iterative fashion, okay? So uh, at the beginning, uh, you're going to initialize your uh, uh, entity with some uh, representation embedding, mu zero, okay? It can be computed based on the raw input feature such as image feature or, or, or text feature, and you get mu zero. And once you have this initialized, you're going to update this embedding in an iterative fashion according to this uh, graph connectivity structure. So the simplest form will be like this. Um, you're going to, for instance, so if I want to update the embedding representation for a particular node, uh, mu one, so I'm going to ask the neighbors of mu one uh, according to this knowledge base connect connection uh, and send in their, their representations, okay? Uh, in mu one, I'm going to aggregate all these neighborhood uh, representations and then perform one layer neural updates here, okay? The key kind of uh, uh, feature of this update is, uh, this update is going to be parameterized as neural nets with parameter w1, w2 here. Uh, you're not going to fix it beforehand. It's going to be some parameter uh, learned uh, with some downstream tasks together, okay? And then this operator is also applied, uh, shared across all nodes in the network. Although uh, each node in the network is going to have different number of neighbors, but the, the parameter is going to be shared according to uh, different nodes, okay? So the, the differences in the neighborhood structure is sort of uh, reduced by this summation kind of operation, okay? Okay, so there are, there are many variants of this. I'm just presenting the most basic version. But once you have these uh, uh, um, neighborhood embedding aggregated and updated, you will get a new embedding, right? So, so supposedly this embedding for this node one is going to already incorporate the, the you know, individual, the feature from node one and also the neighborhood uh, features. And you can actually use this update operator and work on the, uh, the rest of the nodes. Then, then you, you finish the update for each node in the network. So now the embedding or representation for each one is node is going to take into account the neighborhood information as well. So, but you are not going to stop there. You're going to iterate for a second round and, uh, and maybe up to T rounds, you finish it. So, so every node, it, the representation of it is going to, in some sense, incorporate uh, a larger, a neighborhood of key hops away, okay? Once you have these uh, embedding, right? And then you can imagine that you can use it for many uh, tasks. You can take the embedding and define some prediction function for individual node to predict the property of a particular node. Or you might, uh, uh, you know, uh, attempt the predicting relationship between two nodes by looking at the embedding of a pair of nodes, okay? And you could also make prediction about uh, a collection of nodes, uh, small, small groups. And uh, depending on the task you have, you might train these uh, parameters in this graph neural net together with the additional parameter you might have in this classification function with either supervised learning or unsupervised learning, even reinforced learning. Uh, I'm going to briefly show some examples of, of uh, different way of training it later on, right? So it looks like uh, uh, this graph neural net, right, is quite a powerful kind of uh, model for aggregating both these type of network structure, combinatorial structure, and also potential features from individual nodes could be image feature or text feature. It has a little bit of the flavor of combining perceptual task and, and symbolic reasoning, right? right. But, but, uh, but the question is, uh, uh, what does this neural net learn exactly, right? How do we actually interpret this uh, graph neural net? Yeah, what is it? So you mentioned this, this the simplest form. I'm guessing that uh, if there were labels on the edges or some of these different things, that some of the tools uh, aggregate for the kind of relation. That's right. So I'm presenting the simplest version where uh, I know the type of the edges. If you have different type of relationship, you can use different uh, parameter for passing messages. And then sometimes you can actually also group your node into different you know, clusters. And for different clusters, you use slightly different parameter. You can always make the model more flexible by having more parameters or even have more sophisticated update here. Use all these uh, uh, model maybe from natural language processing. LSTN kind of idea, you can have a gating on your neighbor, you can have also gating on the, uh, the number of iterations. All this idea can be incorporated here. So you will see different uh, version of graph neural nets or different kind of architectures. So uh, you can use all this, right, to make it more flexible, right? So if I could ask one other quick question. Uh, is Or is it sometimes actually beneficial to have to go and do some of the 
Right. Typically, in practice, you will fix the number of iterations. It's beneficial to have that in real uh, data set prediction. So uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, when you restrict the number of iterations, it's just looking at a limited neighborhood of a network. And then um, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, actually, uh, if you increase the T, yeah, actually there's some problem in terms of the chaining the network to convert. It's like you have the gating vanishing problem over time. You know. uh, so people try to add some gating mechanisms uh, if you have larger T. For instance, I can forget some uh, the embedding from some iterations and, and keep the older ones to, to actually allow this model to increase the number of iterations. But the way is, where it, where it is typically you don't run it into convergence, okay? You just run it with a fixed number of iteration T, okay? Right. And uh, in many of the network, actually, if you also look at the maybe six hops away, it pretty much covers all the nodes in the network. And there's also computational uh, issues if you want to look at uh, larger neighborhood, okay? Yeah. Okay, can you speak a little bit louder? Uh, you can hear. Could you set this context to only affect the network that you're trying to predict? Like, for instance, if you're trying to predict the network, you don't want to predict the network. So the, the context is incorporated in the iterative fashion, you know. For one step, it's incorporated immediate neighbor. Okay. So, but after you iterate two times, it's like a neighbor neighbor's information already aggregated. Right. Yeah. So this is the most basic version, and you can imagine all these, uh, it has all the problems you will see in natural language processing. If you have long sequences, the sequence there is going to correspond to the number of iterations here. But here there's additional kind of uh, heterogeneity here because each node has different number of neighbors, right? And um, uh, you actually want to use the same set of parameters to accommodate potential uh, differences in the nodes. That's where this pooling operation comes along. Okay. okay. Right. And then uh, it's an architecture like this, right? So it, it, it actually has a very similar fashion as we run, for instance, mean field approximation graphical model, right? So mean field approximation graphical model, what we'll do is we have some posterior distribution for each individual nodes, and we want to update the posterior distribution of the center node, for instance, H1, we're going to take in there you know, uh, posterior distribution and perform some fixed updates. But here, the update is going to be parameterized. And then the actual update parameter is going to be learned based on downstream operation, okay? Okay, right. Um, so the question is what uh, how does it learn exactly and how do we understand it? And actually, uh, one interesting adaptation, you, interpretation you can, you can made out of the graph neural net is comparing it to something called the graph isomorphism test, okay? So in, in this case, we just look at the connectivity structure of the network. We, uh, for the moment, ignore the actual feature in particular nodes. What is graph isomorphism test? It, it's a very traditional kind of uh, problem, uh, uh, fundamental problem in computer science and graph theory. Uh, you're provided with two graph structure, x and x pi. And uh, each one is node, uh, in this case, are the same exactly. The differences between two graphs are really just the, connect, the, the structure, right? So the, the, the node is just red color one, okay? So uh, how, how, how are you going to tell the difference between the two? You, you need to build an algorithm to do that. So one uh, very effective algorithm, uh, also approximate algorithm, which runs, you know, TI iteration is going to be something called Weisfeller lemon test that people actually uh, have developed this a long time ago, but recently people used it in uh, uh, de 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 designing kernels for our graph data. And now we also actually use it for understanding graph neural nets. So what is this uh, uh, Westphalia lemon test? So it's actually an iterative algorithm as well. Uh, you will find that it's actually awfully similar to mean field inference and graph neural nets. So what is it doing? So uh, uh, this uh, algorithm is going to actually run this kind of uh, uh, message passing uh, iteration as well. Uh, uh, each iteration, the node will ask the neighbor to send in their color or labels, okay? And then uh, once the, the neighbor send in their the labels, you will, you will hatch, actually have this type of multi-set uh, kind of representation for each one's you know, uh, in, uh, incorporating neighborhood structure, okay? So I can simplify this, uh, this multi-set type of label a bit. Right. 
And then, for instance, I just recoded uh, or recolor these nodes. If it's one, 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 if uh, center node is one, you have two one neighbors. I recolor it as a green two, okay? If it's one, 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 it's three, four, okay? So I'm using different color to actually also denote this different kind of local neighborhood structure. Then I can turn the top two graphs into two graphs like this, okay? If I just look at the, the number of colors in the two graphs, you know, green color and then the blue color and red color, so these two graphs are still the same. So if I just run one iteration, I get a different color of this graph, but it still looks the same, right? I cannot tell the difference between the two. Um, uh, at this point, you will run this algorithm again, okay? Uh, you can run it for the second iteration. So for instance, the top node two is going to have a two uh, neighbor, which is a four and three, and uh, you will get some uh, multi-set kind of label like this, okay? You're going to simplify a little bit and then just uh, assign two to four to five and you recolor all these nodes. So now, uh, once you finish the second iteration, you will actually see that uh, uh, these two graphs are different. By just counting the number of nodes assigned to a particular color, for instance, for this blue one, right, uh, it's the same, but for, for instance, the, the purple eight, there are two eight in this first graph, but there are no uh, such color in the, in the second graph. Then immediately you can tell that the, the two graphs are different. So this Westphalian Neumann test has this property that uh, if you uh, run T iterations, within T iterations, you will find differences in the color between two graph. Uh, this graph, these two graphs are definitely not the same, okay? If uh, when you finish T iteration, you, can, you cannot tell the difference. Uh, they may or may not be different, okay? You don't know, right? So it's approximate algorithm, okay? So uh, if they are really different within T step, you, this algorithm definitely will, will tell it, okay? So it, it runs in this iterative fashion, okay? Every time you ask the neighbor to send in their current representation, and then you're going to re, re, recolor or recode it or rehash it again, okay? Um, so uh, if you think about the, the neural net kind of, uh, the graph neural net uh, uh, we presented earlier, it has a lot of similarity there. So instead of doing this, you know, uh, hard transformation from one color to the other one, you're, you're, you're designing some function mapping, taking the, the representation for the neighbors and map it to a new representation instead of uh, doing this type of hard assignment, okay? So actually, one can show that uh, uh, if you have a multi-set function, yeah, taking uh, this type of, uh, of multi-set kind of representation from uh, your neighbors and reduce to some uh, simplified representation, you can always be represented as a function of the, this, this form in the boxes, okay? If you have a uh, vocabulary set of a ground item and you have a multi-set and then a multi-set function can be represented as uh, some gamma function composed with a simple function f. The f is going to apply to individual element in that set, okay? And then uh, actually this function is very similar to the one that uh, we have uh, uh, designed in this graph neural net. So it's going to, this graph neural net is going to look at the representation of the neighbors, okay? The, this new J from the neighbors. And then perform some additive, you know, uh, operation on these neighboring kind of uh, representations and then perform some nonlinear transformation on top of it. In some sense, this neural net, uh, you can show that new neural net, graph neural net can actually present these multi-set functions but it's also parameterized the function. You can be more flexible than just uh, this half mapping over there, okay? So you can think about that the graph neural net can learn this wise pattern, and graph isomorphism test, okay? Uh, but it could potentially go beyond that and, and incorporating additional, uh, you know, node feature and edge feature. And, 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 but for this graph isomorphism test, it's only testing similarity between graph structure alone, right? But this graph neural net, can incorporate in some sense similarity between graph structure and together with potential uh, features, okay? Right, this is a nice uh, relationship. So based on this, uh, in, in some sense, uh, you can think about the a graph neural net is, uh, is learning some representation which can color, you know, color the, the nodes in the graph, okay? So if these two nodes are equivalent uh, uh, in terms of a T-hop neighborhood, they will get similar representation, okay? Or the same representation, or the same color, right? Um, if these two nodes are different, so the representation are different, okay? Uh, but the, this graph neural can be more powerful than that, right? Okay? 
Any question about this? Yeah. Right, so, so uh, based on this intuition, actually you can already do a lot. So you can think about this graph neural net is going to use a very compact vector representation, uh, which represent the local neighborhood of a graph. And uh, based on the representation of the individual node that uh, I talked about earlier, you can either build prediction about the property a, a node in a graph, or you can actually build a model for predicting the relationship between a pair of nodes. Or you can also build a prediction about the subgraph by aggregating or pulling uh, additionally over a set of embedding, okay? So we actually use these graph neural nets for some applications. Uh, one, one is uh, for the uh, classifying of uh, drug molecules, or in this case, actually uh, energy materials. So uh, you can think about that each one of these graphs is going to correspond to a molecule. The node uh, is going to be uh, actons in the molecule. The edge is going to be the chemical bonds between these actons. And then here, essentially, the, the problem is, given your graph structure representing the molecule, you want to predict the property of that molecule. So you can think about that you run graph neural net on top of this uh, molecular graph, and you learn representation for individual nodes, and then you pull, to re pull this representation for the nodes to, uh, to produce a representation for the graph, and then you, you make a prediction about the property, right? So uh, the immediate benefit of graph neural net is, uh, you can actually learn some representation which is very compact. If we use this graph isomorphism text, uh, uh, Westphalen lemon algorithm, you can actually build a representation which is uh, you know, this multi-set type of representation and with, uh, with these uh, this discrete labels. You can actually get a very high dimensional representation of the graph and use that to uh, classify or make a prediction about property. By using neural nets, graph neural net, you learn a very compact representation. You can be 10,000 times smaller, but still uh, being able to produce about the same uh, predicted accuracy. So uh, in this particular figure, the, the, x, the horizontal axis is going to be the dimension of the representation. So if I actually use this graph isomorphism test and I use that to build a kernel function, then the, the dimension of feature need to be one billion. So because in some sense, you're using different number to label different combinatorial graph structures. And you actually need to have uh, 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 like one billion different small graphlets, graph structures to index in each dimension of feature. So it's a little bit like a, a back of words representation, okay? In, in, in natural language processing. So you can think about there using this graph side for test test is back of substructures, okay? Representation. You need to have one billion dimensional feature in order to get to some kind of regression error of uh, 0 0.095. So you can, of course, compress this uh, vector representation by 10 times, 10 times, 10 times. Every time you compress the representation, uh, you're going to lose some performances. But with graph neural net, you are able to fix the uh, dimension of the representation at the beginning, okay, and optimize this parameter for the graph neural net, for instance, for a few hundred dimensions and obtain uh, in the end a representation which gives you uh, the state of art prediction in this data set, okay? So one thing is you can actually learn a very compact representation which is informative about structure property of uh, some, some inputs, okay? And then we also tried it, uh, uh, these uh, graph neural nets in some uh, more kind of unconventional examples. We actually use graph neural nets to design uh, heuristics for solving combinatorial optimization problem over graphs. For instance, uh, uh, we tried the graph neural net on this so-called uh, vertex cover problem in, in, in graph. So this problem, uh, uh, you are provided with the input graph, and then what you want to do is uh, you want to select a small number of nodes as possible, such that uh, each edge in the graph, at least one end, one end has been selected, okay? So, um, what we can do with graph neural net is you can actually use graph uh, convolution neural net to uh, extract some features, right? Uh, learn some representation for each individual node. Yeah, these vectors here. Once you have the representation for a node, you can actually use this representation, hopefully capturing the local graph structure to define your heuristic function for selecting that node. So this is like the, we call it a uh, scoring function or action value function, you can think about it in the reinforcement learning setting. So um, once you define this uh, parameterized heuristic function, uh, you can actually learn the parameter of this heuristic function using reinforcement learning setting, yeah. And, and once you learn that, you can apply this learned heuristic to uh, a new, potentially new input graph 
and then and then see what is the quality of the solution. Okay, so so uh, actually uh, instead of going into more detail, I'm going to just quickly show some uh, videos for comparing. Okay, these uh, learned learned graph neural nets a heuristic, and then with the traditional state of art in some sense heuristic for this problem. So the the, the for this weather cover problem, a very simple heuristic will be. I'm going to pick node with high degrees, okay, uh, and uh, execute this heuristic greedily. Or I'm going to pick a pair of an edge where the, uh, the the sum of the degree of the two nodes are large, and then execute that greedily, right? And um, um, the three graphs here showing the three panel are exactly the same, just because visualization looks different. And every time I pick a node, I'm going to uh, produce a frame for this algorithm. Yeah, you will see a video. And if the uh, algorithm finish, you know, this uh, covering problem fast, it's going to clear out the graph uh, very quickly. So every time the edge is covered, I'm going to remove it. So uh, the, the, the second one and the third panel is going to correspond to those uh, hand design heuristic. And then the first one is learn the graph neural nets. Um, you can see that, that those hand design heuristic initially actually can uh, pick very informative nodes. It, it, it clear out the graph very quickly. But as you uh, progress to the later stage of this algorithm, actually the learned heuristic, the, this graph neural net based heuristic is actually able to solve the problem faster. So the reason why uh, graph neural net is able to solve this problem faster is because this uh, vector representation for this uh, particular node uh, take into account uh, more things than just the degree of that particular node. So you look at the T-hop neighborhood and potentially, we also take into account a little bit of the uh, importance of this particular node uh, to the connectivity of the entire graph, okay? So that's why when graph neural net is picking those nodes, it picks something balanced between them. And um, so the algorithm, when the, this learn heuristic is, is uh, executed, we try to keep the graph connected. So uh, e even near the end of the, this uh, algorithm, uh, everything is connected, you still can pick some nodes which remove lots of the edges. So that's something that you, yeah, uh, you can learn uh, using graph neural net, right? Okay. So these are, are the two kind of uh, uh, application, interesting application of graph neural nets. It's, it's in some sense using this property or, or analogy between graph neural net and and this graph isomorphism test to come up with a new way of describing graphs, right? So it's it's uh, you can think about this graph neural net is designed in a way trying to summarize the graph around this particular node, okay? Trying to come up with a vector to summarize the combinatorial structure around that particular node, okay? So it's a compact representation, and it's also a chainable application, uh, a representation which you can uh, tailor for downstream application you want, okay? So now actually what we want to do is to see where the graph neural net can help logic inference or, or not, okay? So in this case, uh, we are actually looking into something called the uh, Markov logic network. Some people work on, uh, you know, uh, relational uh, learning or natural language processing. You might have already used Markov logic network. It's a very nice framework for combining logic inference with the probabilistic graphical model. Okay. So in this case, uh, we want to see whether graph neural net can also help uh, a Markov logic network in in terms of uh, uh, making it more efficient. Okay. Let me just bring a little bit more uh, formalism into uh, this uh, uh, Markov logic network. So um, in Markov logic network, uh, uh, for this talk, I would like to represent it as some kind of factor graph representation. And, um, and in, in Markov logic network, you're going to look at the uh, knowledge base where there's a set collection of entities or we call logic constant, okay? A, B, C, D, A can be a person, right? B is another person, C is another person. There's a set of entities. And there's a set of uh, um, um, observed relationship curated in this knowledge base. So it's also called the Grundy predicates in this knowledge base. For instance, you actually observed A and B are friends, and A and C are friends, uh, A and B are friends, okay? Okay, so it, it could be that the, the uh, friends, friendship relationship is false, then this particular observed relationship is going to be zero, okay? Uh, and then another predicate that uh, you are interested in is smoking. For instance, you observe uh, some particular pair, some person A is actually smoking, B is actually smoking. So you recorded this uh, there. So these are the actual observations. 
And then of course, there's a, also a set of observation you don't, a set of uh, relationship you don't get observed. So these uh, predicates, uh, these are observed one, there's a set of uh, relationship you don't get observed. For instance, whether DNC are a friendship, friend or not, you don't know, and DND are friend or not, you don't know. So these set of uh, uh, unobserved predicates, uh, you can think about is some kind of a latent variable in the system, okay? Latent variable in the system. So what you want to do uh, is uh, based on this set of observed relationship, you somehow want to make prediction about a set of unobserved relationship, okay? So that's a simple thing you want to do. So what, what, what is so nice about Markov logic network is uh, it, it somehow put a joint distribution over the collection of observed uh, uh, relationship and the set of observed relationship by using some kind of logic formula. For instance, um, um, now we want to model the joint distribution of this collection of uh, binary random variables. So what Markov logic network is going to do is, uh, uh, it's going to use a set of logic formula as your potential function. For instance, in this particular case, the simplest logic relationship, uh, or the logic formula is going to be, if A and B are friends, and uh, A is smoking, then B is going to smoke. So it, it, in some sense, you can connect uh, a set of variable, for instance, in this particular, the first factor, you're gonna connect uh, friendship A, B, this variable with S, A, and S, B, okay? You're connecting or putting some kind of dependency structure on uh, these variables, right? And this is something uh, nice, yeah. It, uh, naturally integrate together these logic kind of uh, constraints with the probabilistic graphical model. You, you actually put some additional weights on this logic formula because some of this formula may not be 100% true. You also want to learn the confidence level for, all, for this particular logic formula. Okay, that's going to correspond to the learning problem of uh, Markov logic network. But, but let's say we already have these weights WF. So um, you have such a joint distribution over the collection of random variables. Some are observed, some are hidden, okay? And then what you want to do is just to do inference on this particular um, um, uh, yeah, graphical model, okay? Right. And, um, and but uh, unfortunately, uh, although this Markov logic network is very nice in some sort of model or formulation, for combining uh, graphical model and uh, logic inference, it's very computation intensive to perform the inference. The major reason is, uh, think about all these uh, predicates here. It's about the relationship between a pair of entity. So suppose you have one million entity or, or people in your database, immediately the number of variable is going to be square uh, in the number of variable. If one million, then it's one to the 12, the number of relationships. On top of it, you also need to connect all this possible, this variable with some kind of logic formula. You have constraints on this, the relationship between all these so many random variables. So it's hard to be efficient. That's why people use uh, some approximate inference to do it, either based on sampling approach or based on something called a variational inference. So the simplest, for instance, uh, way to do inference is using something like a mean field inference. I'm going to approximate the posterior distribution over these uh, hidden variables uh, by using some product distribution, okay? I'm going to actually estimate the parameter in this product distribution using the KL divergence between these, uh, this product distribution, the actual, actual joint distribution. So this is mean field inference, okay? So, um, so this is the challenge in the, in the Markov uh, logic network. That's why uh, all the Markov logic network has been there for many years. And, uh, it, it hasn't been very popular because uh, uh, it's very hard to scale uh, up to more than a hundreds of, you know, uh, entity, okay? So, but nowadays when we are constructing this uh, multimodal knowledge base, easily you can get tens of thousands or millions of entities. And, and Markov logic network somehow has not been able to work on that space. Another restriction is uh, Markov logic network sort of work on mostly the, just the connectivity, relational information. And if you have additional feature, for uh, uh, entity, it's hard to incorporate that, okay? So uh, earlier I introduced this graph neural net, right? It looks like uh, if you have graph structure and then you have some additional feature for each one is nodes, this graph neural net can integrate all of them and um, learn some representation. And based on that, uh, you can make some prediction, right? 
So uh, a tempting uh, thing to do is I can just use my graph neural nets on the original knowledge base, okay? And learn some representation for each individual node and then uh, use that to define my posterior distribution here, okay? So I learn some representation for individual node, right? And then uh, especially in this case, uh, I can learn some representation for individual entity and then use uh, the, you know, a pair of entity to define my posterior over this type of relational variables. So uh, the, the process is something like this, right? Uh, one thing I can do is uh, I take the original knowledge base, so which contains one million entities and some observed relationships. So typically the number of observed relationships is small, right? And then it's very sparse network. So I don't have these uh, square blow up in the number of variables, okay? I run graph neural nets on, on top of my knowledge base. So it only involves this entity and also these observed relationships, right? And then once you finish running graph neural nets, you learn some representation for uh, each one of these entities. You also learn some representation for each one of these observed facts, actually. But we will mainly use this, okay? And you can, because uh, uh, you can think about the graph neural net is actually learning some kind of color, right? Some, some coloring of the node. If two nodes are equivalent, they should get, in terms of graph connectivity, they will get the same embedding or say the same color, right? So but when you say you, uh, you learn this, uh, what's the training objective? Is it some kind of pseudo-likeness? The, the training objective in this case will be, a um, uh, very simple one is going to be just a KL.version. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought uh, you were still talking about how to, how to fix Q. Yeah. Uh, and then you were going to talk about uh, the- The inference. How to fix Q for inference. Yeah, so that's right. Yeah, so, so the simplest thing is P is given. The, the W is there is given. And then you just want to, based on the set of formula given to you, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. And then just make prediction based on that provided graphical model, right? Because that's going to be a key building block for learning as well. If you're able to do that efficiently, you will be able to do learning efficiently, okay? And, and the parameters of the, the GPS Q are going to be uh, independent of O, is that right? You're gonna learn one set of parameters yeah, you, you, yeah, right, you, you hope so, right, that's right, yeah. So, so uh, you're going to use these graph neural nets, right, the uh, share set of parameters that run on this uh, knowledge base the, with only observed facts, right? So you learn some representation for each individual entities. Then um, once you have that, right, that's why I say GNN on original knowledge base, you provide, you are going to obtain the vector embedding for individual entities here, right? And then, uh, and then hopefully, if uh, some entities uh, which has the same, you know, connectivity information, right? In this case, you can see the C and D actually are equivalent in some sense because C is connected to a fat like this FAC and D is also connected to the fat FAD. And then uh, in terms of graph structure, they are equivalent, yeah? And once you have this embedding, then you can actually define your posterior distribution this way, okay? If you want, I want to predict, uh, uh, I want to parameterize this Q, right? This Q for this particular predicate B and C. I can just take the embedding of B and the embedding of C and define my uh, Q function posterior using these, uh, the corresponding embedding of B and C. That, that's what, what is here, okay? With additional parameter which is specific to a relation. Yeah. Is it possible by taking that Q function and parameterizing it using the I see, so that, that's, uh, that's the application specific. So you need to experiment with uh, the dimension of the embedding in order to, later on I have some, some experiment. Typically you can use uh, a few hundred dimensions or maybe 64 dimensions. That's some hyperparameter you need to choose, okay. Right, okay, and then, um, um, so, so it, yeah, so, so the simplest idea is to do that, right? So you run graph neural nets on the, original uh, knowledge base with only observed facts. And now you have the embedding for each individual nodes, uh, entities. And if I want to make a prediction or parameterize my Q function, uh, uh, you know, the mean field approximation for particular uh, new predicate, yeah, new grounding predicate, I just take the corresponding embedding for this entity and corresponding embedding for this C entity and then uh, have additional parameter theta f over there uh, which is uh, uh, predicate specific to parameterize this posterior distribution, okay? And then uh, similarly, if I want to predict the distribution 
uh, parameterize these uh, uh, mean field approximation for uh, this singleton, I would just use the embedding for mu c, right? Okay. Um, yeah, that that could be very efficient. So the question is, is this okay for for a Markov logic network or not? Right. Uh, yeah. Um, so the actually the answer is no, right? This graph neural parameterization is not enough. So uh, the reason I, I'm going to explain with a few example is, uh, um, although uh, in the original knowledge base, yeah, with this bus connection, right, you don't have these top layer, you know, uh, formulas. Uh, although some nodes are equivalent, okay, CMB are equivalent, but the, when you have a, a logic formula introduced on the top, constraining these formulas, these two nodes are no longer equivalent. Okay, you actually have to take into account that. So uh, graph neural net is taking into account some, you know, uh, uh, equivalence or symmetry in the graph structure. But, uh, but uh, uh, when you have additional formula, uh, you know, some new asymmetry may be introduced, you actually have to take into account. You cannot just do it with the uh, observed knowledge base. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, so, so this is the idea, using graph neural net to, to parameterize these uh, approximate inference uh, Q, okay? And then um, optimize the parameter graph neural net, you, you can actually do a prediction function for any of these unobserved uh, predicates, okay? So uh, one thing you can show is if you don't have a formula, so actually this is okay, right? If you don't have a formula, that, that's okay. It's like uh, you, you don't have any additional constraints about this logic variable. You can show that uh, if uh, two nodes Suppose you have a two nodes x and x pi, they are equivalent, they have the same color, they have the same embedding according to the original knowledge base, and y, y pi, they have the same embedding or same color for the original knowledge base. And then you have two predicates, f uh, x and y, and f x pi and y pi, okay? Their posterior distribution has to be the same, okay, if you don't have that, right? So it's like uh, you have, uh, in this particular case, if you don't have additional formula, then uh, dc, and DD in this case, the, the parameterization for their posterior has to be the same, okay? Because uh, uh, B and B are equivalent and C and B are equivalent, okay? Okay, right. But the things gets more complicated actually uh, because we have this additional formula for a Markov logic network. So these are the uh, network for the original knowledge base and with uh, uh, this latent variable attached, but Markov logic network is something on top of it. Have this formula kind of knows constraining uh, what value can this uh, individual variable can take. So uh, the question is, uh, if you have equivalences in this bottom network, do you have actually equivalence in the top network or not, okay? And uh, if it's not, then you have to change your parameterization. You cannot just use the uh, embedding uh, for you obtained with this knowledge base to parameterize your posterior distribution, okay? So uh, actually, uh, I just give you two set of content examples that you will see that the graph neural net alone in this sparse network is, is not enough. You have to actually make some modifications. So the first example is going to be something like this. Suppose you have, now you have two formula instead of one formula. The first formula is still the same as before. You have this friend A and B. If A is smoking, then B is smoking. But the second formula is going to be uh, A, if A leave uh, alone, then uh, A is single, it's, it's something sim simple like this, okay? You have these two formula there. Um, and you have this additional predicate, which is leave alone and then single, right? And then uh, if you look at the Markov logic network on the top right here, and you will find that uh, this uh, SA, single, single A and single B, they are actually equivalent to each other, okay? Because you ha only have this uh, simple formula, uh, this second formula, which con connects these uh, single predicates with the uh, live alone predicates. So in this uh, Markov logic network level, these two nodes are actually equivalent, okay? And then, but uh, if you look at knowledge base, so this is the original knowledge base here. So you have uh, A entity and B entity. So you observe that the A actually like, you know, live alone is this, and then B is this, and uh, th this one is, uh, uh, maybe, yeah, okay, yeah. And then you have additional, there's a two more edges. Actually the edges, there's no cross edges. But there's additional observation for A. There's a obs additional observation for A, and which is uh, smoking of A. So based on the original knowledge base, right? So the A and B two nodes are not equivalent, okay? So because this A node has 
additional smoking observation. If you run graph neural net in the original net database, you will never find the AGR equivalent because the local connectivity are not the same. And if you use new, new A and new B to define the posterior for a single A and single B, they will get the different parameterization, okay? Right, so, so the cases where the variables in the Markov logic network are the same, are equivalent to each other, but in the original noise base is not the same, okay? Because of this additional observation which has nothing to do with the formula two, okay? So actually this case is easier to solve. Uh, you just need to separate these predicates in, in some sense. You can cluster these predicates according to the formula. You know, one set of uh, predicate, they're related to this, uh, connected uh, according to this formula. Another set of predicate which is completely disjoint with uh, one set of predicate. You can actually separate knowledge base into two sub knowledge base, okay? And one for each one is cluster of uh, variables. And then you run graph neural net on, on them separately, yeah? Once you have the embedding, two sets of embedding, then you use the, uh, the, the predicates to define that particular, yeah? Uh, posterior distribution. So in this case, uh, because this uh, uh, s uh, single and live alone is in one database, and based on this graph, actually you, you find that the embedding of mu and A and mu B are the same, and you use it to define the posterior distribution, you also get the same parameterization, okay? Uh, you can do this separately. So this is the case where in the Markov logic network, the variable are equivalent, but in the original knowledge base, they are not the same, so in this case, you have to cluster uh, the predicate according to the formula and then do and separate your knowledge base into you know, uh, two knowledge base or more and run graph neural net in each individual one and use those embeddings in individual ones to define the posterior distribution, okay? This is uh, one direction. So the other direction is actually um, when the two nodes in the knowledge base, they are equivalent, actually the, 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 the corresponding uh, variable in the Markov knowledge network is not, okay? So this is another type of counter example. For instance, in this case, you have A, B, uh, E, F. So um, it can be that the A is a friend of E, and then A is not the friend of F, right? And then, but, uh, but, uh, but the E is a friend of B, and then B is a friend of uh, uh, F. So in this case, actually, A and B are equivalent in terms of graph structure. And E and F are equivalent in terms of graph structure. So if you run graph neural nets on this knowledge base, yeah, then uh, you will get uh, A, B, they will get exactly the same embedding, right? Because this graph neural net is just trying to, uh, you know, capture the graph structure. And E, F, e and F will get exactly the same uh, graph embedding. But if you look at the Markov logic network, if it has a formula like, uh, um, you know, uh, connecting the, uh, a friendship with like, okay? So this is like, and you want to make prediction about the posterior of this like variable, then you will find that actually this uh, like of AE and like of BE, they are not equivalent, okay? Because through the formula, they connect to different observations, FAE and FBE, okay? The graph structure is not the same, okay? So uh, this is the second case where, uh, when you run graph neural nets in the uh, original knowledge base, Two nodes are equivalent, but if you actually look at the, uh, the corresponding variable in the Markov logic network, they are not equivalent, okay? Yeah, in that case, if I look at the color, they have to be the same, but actually they, they are not. So in this case, uh, the graph neural net is also not enough. Uh, in this case, you cannot separate the different relationship into a uh, sub-knowledge base and, and do it separately. So here, you actually need to compensate this difference with some additional entity uh, specific embedding, okay? We call it entity specific. So you have to um, add some entity specific embedding, just, just some vector mu A and omega B and omega E or omega F. And uh, in your parameterization of the posterior distribution for like A, E, like B, you have to add that compensation into your parameterization, yeah? The first part here, based on the graph neural net, it's going to be the same. Right, but that's not going to be enough to tell the path differences in LAE and LBE. So you have to add this uh, tunable parameter, omega there, to compensate uh, that kind of loss in flexibility, okay? So these are the two cases. In the end, uh, in some sense, when you're trying to use graph neural net to parameterize the posterior kind of uh, inference, 
or the mean field posterior inference for macro logic network, you have to do two things. One thing is um, you have to separate the, uh, you know, different uh, relation clusters into sub knowledge base and, 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 and get multiple sets of graph uh, embedding. Okay. The second thing you need to do is you also need to attach some small tunable embedding uh, afterwards in the definition of graph neural nets uh, of the posterior distribution. Okay. In order to compensate uh, for this type of uh, additional asymmetry created by the logic formula. Okay. Um, so the, this is, uh, if you do this, you can actually get some efficient inference approach for uh, graph neural net. We actually experiment with some of these uh, benchmark data set, uh, typically used in these Markov logic network. One, one is kinship. It's a synthetic data set. You can always increase the number of entities and, um, uh, and then create larger and larger databases. So uh, you can see that in this kinship, we have different version. When you increase the number of entity to just be a few hundred, uh, the number of variable in WAF can be very large. It's like the ground and atoms, it's ground predicates can be, you know, uh, close to one million. And then uh, the ground formula can be even larger, okay, 49 million. And then there's another one, which is the UW CSE uh, knowledge base. Um, you have faculty and student pages from different areas. And then um, uh, the, 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 the predicates can be 50K and the number of uh, ground formula can be, the formula nodes can be 154 million, okay? You really don't want to do inference in this, this fully grounded uh, network, yeah? And Cora is something uh, pretty large for a macro logic network, like, like 600 uh, entities. And then the number of ground predicates going to 100K, and then the, the formula nodes is going to be 400 million, okay? And um, so the, the task we want to sort of uh, uh, make prediction about is uh, uh, we want to actually make query about some of these predicates. You never have a solutions in your database. Let me give you some example for this, okay? And, and this is a U, UWCSE data set. So uh, you can think about the entity there will be some uh, person student web page and then professor web page and then some course web page, some paper, uh, you know, uh, entity node. And then there's relationships such as teaching and the publishing, and what is, uh, what, what the, the, the kind of uh, relationship you want to query or make prediction about is the advisor-student relationship. But it, uh, in this data set, you can intentionally mask out all these uh, student-advisor relationship. I want you to make prediction about that. So uh, uh, in macro logic network, you can specify a set of relationships, okay, logic relationships. So if uh, it is advised by some, S is by P, then P is a professor, you know, if S is advised by P, then uh, yeah, so it's not year one or something that's uh, specific to that university. You can specify a set of relationship constraining these variables, right? And, but for that prediction you want to make about advisor student, you never have any observation, okay? So this is a, uh, actually called as a similar in some sense. Uh, in here, the node is going to the paper uh, and the venue and the author. You want to uh, make prediction whether uh, two nodes in this knowledge base are the same author or not. Sometimes because a smart wording problem, uh, you have the same author created as different nodes. You want to deduplicate the nodes, right? So you can also have a set of uh, uh, kind of logic formulas to constrain these variables, but you never have observation about actually uh, where, whether two nodes are the same author or not, right? So then uh, with this, uh, uh, we call, uh, this is the one using neural nets. And, uh, so the, the actual relationship we want to predict, we have data, but we held it out, right, and make prediction. In the kinship, um, there's some previous approach for doing it for Markov logic inference, including NCNC-based approach, brief forgation-based approach, and some something based on NAP assignment. And this is something recent uh, from the last CQ2 group using hinge loss Markov uh, random field to do it. Uh, you can get uh, the best performance, you can get 1% because this data set has no noise at all. So this graph neural net based approach is pretty much opposing these uh, perfect uh, uh, prediction, uh, but in some real world data sets, actually, uh, you can see a significant boost in some of the cases. For instance, I want to predict a, uh, in UW CSE case, I want to predict student advisor relationship. For some areas, you get big boost, for instance, language. I don't know why, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and in some area, you, you get smaller boost, but uh, consistently you see this uh, increasingly 
uh, prediction accuracy. And the core data set is very large for all this master. So we run the package for, for making prediction for core data set. It cannot finish in 24 hours. But for this new net-based approach, you're able to actually finish it in a, reason, a few hours. And then uh, you can get to a 0 0.6 uh, accuracy, right? So, so sort of this is a different way of looking at the, the, at the efficiency issue. For different version of kinship, as you increase the number of entities, you know, the, 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 the inference problem becomes larger and larger. And all these uh, other methods can just no longer finish it, okay? And then by the graph neural net is able to finish this, this is the graph neural net can finish within a small amount of time and produce very uh, accurate results. So this is a sort of more refined number of it. And actually, it's just in minutes. Uh, graph neural net can finish UWCSE. Yeah. And then for NGNG and other approach, it takes much, you know, one order or two order of magnitude, more time to actually finish inference. And, and Cora, uh, uh, graph neural net is the only method which can finish in, in 24 hours, okay? So uh, it looks like uh, um, for graph neural net, indeed have some promises, you know, in, in helping us, uh, scaling us some of these uh, logic inference, especially in the case when you combine logic inference with probabilistic graphical model. So this graph neural net is able to capture some of these, uh, in some sense, similarity in the connectivity pattern or the graph topology locally, right? And then summarizing in a very compact vector. And uh, it also have the promises of you know, take into account or integrate additional node feature, edge feature in your network. It looks like it could be a very promising tool for integrating, you know, a symbolic reasoning and then the perceptual kind of ability. But when you are using the graph neural net for this kind of logical inference, you want to do it rigorously, actually you need to take into account the additional constraints created by this kind of logic formula. So it's not just running in the original kind of knowledge base, uh, and uh, using that to define your know, whatever prediction, you have to take into account the subsequent task in order to uh, get the right architecture, a right parameterization. So uh, overall, I think the graph neural net is uh, very interesting. Uh, it has, uh, for, for many methods uh, I've seen, uh, this one seems to be the closest to you know, combining the perceptual ability and symbolic kind of reasoning ability. And I think there will be more work on this direction and hopefully we can push uh, real intelligence, uh, one step forward. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Right, so what, one, one idea I have is uh, you can take some of these existing graph algorithms and uh, especially those hard ones and very often heuristic or approximation algorithms is designed for those problems. Uh, typically they use a very simple local statistics of the graphs such as degree or some maybe some other uh, metric uh, summarizing the local graph structure. So instead of uh, using the traditional kind of hand design heuristic, you can use these graph neural nets to parameterize uh, you know, the local neighborhood structure of the graph or learner representation and chain this algorithm. So I can imagine many combinatorial optimization over graph could be done uh, differently, especially in the case you care about average case performance of the algorithm. It could be done very, very different. We actually look at the uh, Charon Sesman problem and, and also set cover problem and also max card problem uh, for graph as well, right? I can imagine there's so many other graph problems which is hard uh, you can actually use graph neural net potentially do better uh, on average cases, okay? Good. Okay, thank you.
I didn't invest in that perspective. That's not what I did. Uh, 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 the jacking uh, or something. Somehow, the dropping is yeah, not quite You might be yeah. able to. Yeah, it's just very hard to think about that. But that definitely uh, one thing Simon was thinking about. Yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah. But it's hard to argue. Yes, I mean, you'd have to construct yeah, different. Yeah, Whatever sleeping you have will have a cascading effect. Right, too. that's right, exactly. And uh, what you want, don't want to do is you don't want to work with original CV code. It's a huge mess of uh, you know, formulas and that kind of uh, new stuff. You want to actually work with the original object. And the <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's more interesting. Yeah, but that's this is really interesting. I, I don't work on graphs. 